Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum everybody and hello. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today on legitimizing apartheid, why Israel isn't eligible for the visa waiver program. Almost two weeks ago, the U.S. and Israel signed an MOU to facilitate Israel's entry into the visa waiver program. And upon signing the MOU, a 30 to 45 day trial period began in order to test Israel's eligibility to enter the program. Um, if Israel fulfills the statutory requirements to extend reciprocal privileges to U.S. citizens and nationals, it is said to be admitted into the visa waiver program, which would allow Israelis to be eligible to enter the U.S. visa-free for 90 days. For obvious reasons, AGP Action and AMP, alongside many other organizations and Palestinians, don't believe that Israel should be admitted into the visa waiver program, given their long-standing discriminatory track record of denying entry to Palestinian and Arab Americans, Muslims, and Americans who support Palestinian rights in general. To discuss this issue in further detail with us today, we have Zaha Hassan. Zaha is a human rights lawyer and a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her research focus is on Palestine-Israel peace, the use of international legal mechanisms by political movements, and U.S. foreign policy in the region. A quick disclaimer for everybody, Zaha is a researcher who has been working on the issue and has been meeting with policy uh, makers regularly, but she cannot provide any legal advice on this issue. Um, with that being said, Zaha, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we've been working on, you know, against Israel's admission into the visa waiver program, given their discriminatory policies, which clearly don't have the capacity guidelines for admission. Um, can you give us a background on the unofficial MOU's terms and what it means for Israel? Thanks so much, um, Aya, for having me and to AJP and AMP for, for the opportunity to kind of shed some light. I have to be honest, I mean, um, the situation is anything but clear. Um, before I get into the muck of it all, um, I think what I want to do is just kind of remind us all where we started from. You know, we've been hearing at least for the last one and a half years that, um, you know, this Israel's entry into the visa waiver program was going to be a boon for Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, Palestinians in particular. Um, who have had difficulties in entering Israel and the occupied territories for many decades now. In addition to that, those categories of people, uh, Americans writ large who have been critical of Israel or who have supported Palestinian human rights have also faced difficulties. And we understood that this visa waiver program was going to um, end all of that discriminatory treatment uh, entry denials, um, uh, searches, unreasonable searches, unreasonable unre interrogation on exit and entry, all of these things were going to cease because Israel was going to treat all U.S. citizens the same way, and we were going to be treated the same way Israeli nationals are treated when they enter the United States without uh, or transit through the United States. So that was what the promise was, right? Um, and and we were given the slogan, blue is blue, which referring to the U.S. passports, that all U.S. passports are going to be, um, you know, equally uh, valued uh, at, at Israel's borders and the borders that it controls. Um, however, what we know today to be the case is anything but blue is blue. What we know today, um, based off of, as you mentioned, I, a, a MOU that that the U.S. government has not officially released, but that we understand to be um, the, the terms and conditions of Israel's trial period uh, into this uh, visa waiver program. Essentially, what the MOU uh, does is it creates, it doesn't create actually, what it does is it accepts Israel's differential treatment of um, people holding uh, Palestinian IDs and it creates um, understandings around how Israel is going to treat Palestinian ID holders in particular um, when they try to enter um, or exit or transit. And uh, largely what the biggest change is, I would say, is that uh, a Palestinian uh, ID holder that um, 
uh, is from the West Bank will be able to use the airport. That's the promise, that they'll be able to use Ben Gurion Airport and rather than having to go through Allenby. Um, other than that, to be quite frank, I don't see much change uh, in how Israel is going to be treating Americans. And I can kind of go through some of the concerns that I have. And I have, I think, four concerns that I, I want to um, raise uh, with you. I should... Uh, go back and just say, at, as, as it pertains to Gaza ID holders, Palestinians with Gaza IDs, they are largely um, cut out of the visa waiver program. Only a very small number of people with Gaza IDs are going to be able to um, um, enter Gaza, people that have first degree family members. That's the promise in the, you know, that we've been told. But um, as I go through discussing the MOU, um, even, even that is in question because of the way in which the actual implementation um, uh, is uh, today in this trial period that we've been told. So again, now this is a MOU that concerns um, a trial period, but also promises certain things are gonna take place as Israel enters the visa waiver program. And it talks about, um, what's needed for, for Israel's entry into the visa waiver program. Again, this is a MOU. It's not a legally binding document of any kind. Um, Israel's not bound. The U.S. is not bound. It's not a treaty between the two countries. So anything promises Israel's made in this document, you know, it's, uh, it's not bound by. Um, but we do know, and we, there was an article actually today in the Times of Israel uh, that said, you know, U.S. officials recognize that it will be very difficult for them to walk back from Israel's entry into the visa waiver program. So promises that the U.S. makes uh, in, in, in admitting Israel into the program, hard to undo. Israel's compliance with um, the terms and conditions, um, much more fluid. Uh, because this is not a legal do document. Um, and why hasn't the U.S. government released the MOU, the official MOU? That's a good question. And I think people um, who want to have some clarity about their rights should be talking to their members of Congress and asking um, them to, on their behalf, get a, an official copy of this MOU and demand it from, the, from U.S. officials. This isn't classified information. This is information about the rights and responsibilities um, that Palestinian Americans have and other Americans have vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the obligations Israel has to American citizens. So it is, is important for um, uh, Americans to be able to see the, see the MOU and to understand the terms. Um, a second concern I have besides that this MOU has not been officially, you know, um, released is that, you know, entry into this trial is being rushed to meet a deadline, which is the end of this fiscal year, September 30th. And it's it's based on getting to that deadline and, and getting Israel admitted into the program by September 30th, rather than on making sure that this is a successful um, trial and that Israel is complying with federal statute. Um, you know, this trial started at the tail end of the summer travel season. There has been no public campaign to inform people about the trial for them to know what their rights are. And again, we don't have an a, a official MOU that tells them what their rights are. We do have the U.S. Uh, State Department website and the U.S. Embassy website, but there's been conflicting information on the website versus when you actually talk to a consular official. So this is problematic. The MOU has no yardsticks in it to measure compliance. So during this trial period, we don't know what is gonna be considered compliance with uh, reciprocity. What we do know again, is that there's differential treatment of Americans based on whether they have a Palestinian ID from the West Bank or Gaza, or whether they hold no ID whatsoever. Um, we, we know that, but there's nothing in the MOU that talks about what compliance looks like and what would make Israel ineligible besides, um, besides the, um, uh, what we know about who, who the terms of uh, entry for different people holding a Palestinian ID. Another concern is that there's no way um, 
to measure whether or not Israel has ended the practice of racial profiling based on uh, ethno-religious identity and national origin. There's a requirement in the MOU <clears throat> that Israel self-report on a weekly basis <clears throat> the number of travelers from the U.S. that has come to the uh, Israeli-controlled ports of entry, the number of uh, denials, the places of birth, and um, their citizenships and the ports of entry that they came through. But there's nothing in there about um, that is meant to collect data on the national origin of a traveler, a U.S. traveler, their religion, their sex, their age. These kinds of uh, data points are important because it would help us to determine whether Israel had a pattern and practice of denying entry to people of a certain um, background and, and not based on any kind of legitimate security concern. And then if you, if, if you have a complaint about Israel, you have to be the one, you the traveler, you the American citizen who has been discriminated against has to affirmatively volunteer that information in a portal, which is fine, but the burden is placed on the traveler rather than creating a system where um, Israel's compliance could be uh, monitored uh, effectively. Another concern is that um, the experience um, that of a, an American entering is going to be in, different, again, as I said earlier, based on your identity. And if you're a Palestinian ID holder, you're going to be treated under uh, martial law. If you're not a uh, Palestinian ID holder, then you, you will be treated under civil law. The MOU uh, calls for a Palestinian West Banker to um, use a uh, app to get a military permit to be able to travel out of the West Bank to uh, across checkpoints and to the airport. Um, if you're coming into the United States and you have a Palestinian ID, you can use the airport without getting the permit theoretically. But if you stay longer in the West Bank on that tourist visa, there's a question of whether or not Israel would con be considering you to be in violation of your visa, even though you're a Palestinian ID holder. So, I mean, there's so many questions about these uh, rules based on your you know, the ID that you hold and where you reside in the occupied territories. And of course, as I said before, you know, the uh, Gaza ID holders, while they were told that if they live abroad, they could come in and use the airport to travel inside Israel and travel to the West Bank, uh, they would not be allowed into Gaza unless they had a first degree family member and only if that first degree you know, and if they did, they would have to get permission 45 days in advance to visit that that person. So that means before they actually travel to um, Israel and the occupied territories, they would need to get that permit um, 45 days before travel. Um, but, but if you ask, if you go look at the Israeli website to see about this permit system, uh, you will not find it there uh, because there, it doesn't exist as far as Israel is concerned. So there's a question between what the U.S. has promised um, is going to happen on, on their websites and uh, and and um, and in the MOU versus what Israel is saying uh, the policy will be for people with a Gaza ID. So there's there's just all this confusion about uh, between the U.S. and Israel about how they're treating different classes of, of um, Americans, particularly Palestinians with IDs. And a, a fifth concern is um, there hasn't been much thought into how to curb Israel's misuse of security as a justification for Israel denials or for entry denials. Excuse me. We all know that one of the bases Israel has for denying uh, disfavored groups entry into Israel and the occupied territories is security. There's security concerns. And um, in this MOU, there's nothing in there that talks about protecting the rights of Americans who, um, who have been critical of Israel for, um, and, and having them uh, be able to enter. People like Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, for example, um, there's nothing in there that talks about or guarantees the rights of Americans to be protected for their First Amendment activity. And in fact, the MOU says that laws 
that no laws have to be changed as a part of this visa waiver um, uh, program trial period um, or even after. Uh, and there are laws on, on the books in Israel, immigration laws that prevent entry or exclude people who um, are supportive of BDS activity. Um, those people in writ large are considered security problems for Israel anyway. So the question is, how can the U.S. guarantee that um, there is going to be no discrimination? The MOU doesn't talk about it. And uh, we know that Israel still has on its books this idea that they will exclude people for this basis. So there's just a lot of questions. And we know just from this last week of implementation that you know we're having mixed reviews. Yes, some people are able to enter now, people with West Bank IDs who weren't able to use the airport. They're able to use the airport. Many of them are able to use the airport and they're having good experiences because of, you know, uh, they've, ne they've never had the ability to use that airport. But then there are many others who have tried, like people with Gaza IDs who've tried to enter uh, during this trial period and were turned back. Uh, or people that weren't allowed um, to, to rent a car uh, with Israeli plates that have Palestinian IDs. That's something actually the MOU does talk about. It does mention Israeli laws around that restrict use of certain transportation. And um, uh, it actually acknowledges that and doesn't change that. So, so, you know, Israel is continuing that policy with Palestinian Americans who are entering, not allowing them to, to rent cars and not allowing them to drive across checkpoints. There are actually people that have had cars that were able to somehow get a, a rental car <laughs> We're told they weren't allowed to drive their rental car across checkpoints because um, they're not allowed uh, under military law in, um, in the occupied territory. So they had to have some friend drive the car across the checkpoint and they walked across. So these are all the different um, you know, ways in which Palestinian Americans in particular are experiencing um, this MOU. It's obviously not blue is blue. It's not even bluish. It's it's some other color that's not in the, the spectrum of color that I know about. And so I think it's really important that um, that we're having this conversation today because I really would like to hear from your um, your guests what experiences they're having. Yeah, and we know that you know the U.S. Embassy in Israel has a form now that people can kind of. Um, fill in whatever incidents they had or if they were denied but like we also don't have access to that data which is another issue because how do we know that the data being collected is being fair too um, you kind of answered a lot of the questions that have been asked but obviously to your point we know that the MOU as it stands or at least the unofficial version doesn't provide reciprocal like visa free entry for all U.S. citizens which goes against the number one condition of a be being admitted into a program, which is reciprocity. Um, and most of the questions we've been getting is like around um, residents having entry and because most of the people being denied right now are Palestinian Americans with a Gaza ID. Um, yeah, there have been reports, you know, where some you know, I think I've seen at least one. I don't want to say some because I've just only seen one person who had a Gaza ID and was able to get into Israel. But, um, you know, once in, you know, all bets are off. Uh, you know, once they travel and transit through Israel and they go to the West Bank, for example, the question then is like, how are you planning to get back to the airport? <laughs> because when you cross the yeah. checkpoint, you um, are going to be stopped. And when they see that you have a Gaza ID, you know, they're going to ask you for your Gaza ID, even if you um, have your your passport and you have that little white paper that they usually give. They're going to ask you and you obviously aren't going to want to lie about that. And um, so then there's going to be trouble. And I don't know that um, all this has been thought through. Because like I said, there's been such a mad rush to meet that September 30th end of fiscal year deadline that um, I, there wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't enough time to really think through all of these things. Like I didn't even, I didn't even think to ask U.S. officials during this, all of our conversations in the last year and a half about the restrictions on Palestinians driving Israeli plated cars. 
Yeah. Would this apply to U.S. citizens? That didn't even occur to me. I thought for sure that would not be uh, a continued policy uh, by Israel because, you know, Rosa Parks could sit on the bus, you know, but a Palestinian can't sit on the bus. <laughs> they, they can't even sit on the bus. They have to get off the bus if it's Israeli plated and cross a checkpoint on foot. Um, it never occurred to me that the U.S. government would actually sanction that kind of treatment of American citizens. It's it's yeah. shocking, to be honest. I think it's shocking and concerning because all of the conversations we've had for the last two years with government officials here in the U.S. about this issue, especially when the COGAT, the new COGAT regulations went into place, they kept telling us, you know, the, the guidelines for the visa waiver program are very strict and clear, like there's no way around it. And now we're here. They have a 30 day trial period to undo decade long discriminatory practices. And think about it. I, I mean, it was only days before the trial start and and uh, State Department officials were saying Israel, State Department and DHS was were, were saying Israel does not currently qualify yeah. for the visa waiver program. So if you know that they don't currently qualify, why would you even start the trial? Wouldn't you first require them to repeal all laws that are discriminatory, uh, at mm -hmm. least as they pertain to you know U.S. citizens? Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't you require um, uh, the COGAT rules to be actually superseded. In fact, in the MOU, it says the COGAT rules as they pertain to short stay visits are superseded. But later on, when you read on in the MOU, it says, in fact, that these rules will get incorporated into this new system called Mor Morum system, which is supposed to mirror our ESTA entry system that we have here in the United States um, for um, visa waiver program countries. And um, so it's not actually superseded. The rule, the military rules that regulate uh, Palestinian presence in the occupied territories are going to become subsumed into this Morum system. So, so um, it's actually it's actually really the U.S. giving sanction to the use of military law against uh, Palestinian Americans. Yeah. So it's continued unconditional support even yeah. throughout the human rights violations. And I just want to give a reminder to our viewers, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments and we'll try to answer them while we're on the webinar. Um, I think the most frustrating thing is that they are only being given a... The frustrating thing is that they've even started this trial, trial period, despite especially the last two years of violence and discrimination that we've seen, but also that it's only a 30-day period trial period. Like... How easy would it be, let's say Israel gets admitted into the program, which is looking likely considering everything that's happening, um, and then they go back to their discriminatory policies and start denying Palestinians again on the basis of security reasons, which we know will happen given you know the government and its track records. How easy is it to reverse um, their admission into the visa waiver program? not easy. So, you know, so putting aside the political, right, because we already mentioned that even U.S. officials recognize that once Israel, Israel gets in politically, it will be hard to um, to snap mm -hmm. back. That's the term that Ambassador uh, Tom Nides used about what he was working with Israel on, a snap back provision that was going to make it so that immediately Israel would be out of the program if they were found to be uh, in out of compliance. The problem with this is, uh, I mean, putting aside the political uh, problems of trying to do this, you know, according to the MOU, there is no snapback. For the trial period, in fact, there's no actual compliance review envisioned. So it talks about giving um, or getting weekly reports from Israel about their um about the entry denials and how many Americans actually entered and what citizenship, other citizenships they have. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't um, say that what what's going to happen if they got like a certain percentage of denials. And, you know, what does it mean? Because we don't even know why they were denied because there's no, they're not required to give you a basis for the denials in the MOU. So how would you know how to assess Israel, you know, 
even if there was a requirement in the MOU that they actually get assessed. In fact, the MOU doesn't envision a review of Israel until six months after it's in the visa waiver program. So, so it looks like the trial period is an on-ramp to get into the program, but there's no off-ramp, you know, for it if it hasn't complied. And like I said earlier, you know, you would want to know certain data to be able to determine if there's discrimination. If, if, the, if the MOU says it's meant to end uh, discrimination and racial profiling um, of Americans, then wouldn't you want to know who, um, if these people that were getting denied, like how many of them were Palestinian <laughs> or Arab or Muslim, you know, I mean, these data points, you have to have them. Otherwise, this is meaningless, this idea that you're monitoring Israel in a trial period. Don't have a trial period, then just admit them in the visa waiver program, because that's what's essentially happening here. Right. Yeah. Um, I think the dangerous thing is that the U.S. always gives Israel the pass to say that they're doing certain things for security reasons and protections and we never know what the security reasons are like you mentioned but going back to talking about palestinian americans in the west bank trying to travel out of the west bank and the app can you touch a little bit more on the security um risks that we have in utilizing the app right so i mean this app uh from what i understand is something that was created during the covid period when um, Israel was trying to track people um, around COVID, you know, contact tracing kind of things. They used it in the West Bank um, as well for movement. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, the Monasak, it's called the Al Monasak app, the coordinator (laughs) app. But for Pal, I mean, there was a a certain tracking that was done for Israeli citizens. This Monasak app was just for for people in the West Bank, and it was for them to be able to apply for permits um, without having to go to the military base to to apply. Um, Like, for example, going to Beit Il to apply to get a permit um, to use, um, you know, for whatever reason, for whatever the purpose of the permit was. Um, So now this app is is included in the MOU as um, being for use for for Palestinians with uh, Palestinian Americans with West Bank ID. So the concern basically is this. I mean, Israel is one of the leading um, spyware uh, developer countries in the world. And there have been already complaints uh, by human rights groups about the Al Munasak app and the possibility that it could be used for inappropriate reasons. The concern here is that it would be used um, you know, as a spyware tool to track the movements and to also be able to hack into <clears throat> the phones of the people, <clears throat> sorry, that are using this app. There hasn't been, as far as I can tell in my conversations, there hasn't been a study of how this app could be misused. And there hasn't been a study <clears throat> on you know, whether it's safe for Americans. Now, remember, the visa waiver program is supposed to be primarily a program for the security of Americans and the national security of the United States. That's the primary purpose. So if you, if we're uh, going to be recommending or requiring in this case, Americans to use um, a tool that's actually developed by the military authority in the West Bank, we should know a lot more about this app and we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't be rushing into a trial to use the app until we have uh, all that information that we need about it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it, I think everything just seems alarming. And this is one thing I think many of us did not expect to occur, especially with the Department of um, Homeland Security. You know, when there's such strict rules and regulations around something, you wouldn't think that Israel would get a pass with this too, but it looks like they're going to get a loophole. Um, so I know that the, the trial started on July 20th. Do we know for sure if it's a 30 or 45 day trial period or is that also unclear? Yeah, I, I asked this question of an official at the Department of Homeland Security just a few days ago. And um, there isn't a clear uh, 
point at which they are going to say that the trial period is over, except that it can't go over September 30th because they need to make a decision by then, which again, like I said, I don't, if you don't have it, um, if you don't have it in the MOU, what you're looking for to determine whether Israel is qualified and you've already created a system where there's no reciprocity to begin with, because remember the MOU um, sanctifies sort of this differential treatment. Exactly what are you assessing? So um, it's not, I don't think it's quite, it's so relevant, like how long we have, you know, you, we have for this trial period, because we, we know that it ha when it has to end and it's just a matter of weeks. So my question, I guess, for, um, you know, for the rest of us that are, you know, wanting to travel or are tr thinking about traveling is, you know, what what can what what do we expect when we travel and who do we um who do we engage with when we have problems and how do we make sure that our complaints are being registered one of the big um uh strange very strange things that came out of this trial period was the discovery by some people that were trying to complain or trying to get answers to their questions about whether or not they could travel because they don't know, since we don't have a real MOU that's been, you know, <laughs> out there and official. Um, when they've called in, they've been met, when they've called into the U.S. Embassy, they've been met by um, a, uh, a staff person who has an Israeli accent. <laughs> and for many Palestinians, being, um, you know, calling a U.S. government phone line a complaint line and being um, received by someone with an Israeli accent is very disconcerting, um, especially when that person might be um, questioning you and not necessarily believing you about your experiences. Um, Palestinians know that uh, all Israelis have uh, military service as a part of their citizenship. And so it's very uncomfortable to be um, complaining when the person you're speaking to has is a dual national is obviously a dual national, an Israeli dual national dual national. So I, I think that you know these kinds of issues uh, they sh should seem like obvious to um, a, someone who's creating a complaint system for Palestinians to be able to to get you know um, some kind of uh, redress uh, of their travel difficulties. It should be obvious that you wouldn't want to um, make them feel uncomfortable to share their stories by having someone that's, that's Israeli on the on the line, you know. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that we're hearing from travelers. And um, and I, so I think it's important before we end our time together for people to know, um, you know, what lines to call, what what uh, portals to enter their complaints if they don't feel comfortable talking on phone lines um, uh, to, to, to have these complaints heard. Um, but it is, you know, it, it is a real um, problem <laughs> that should have been, that should have been dealt with um, before the trial period. And again, that just goes again to say that, you know, the trial period was terribly rushed, you know, um, and for no good reason. Yeah, and I think all of these experiences are showing us that there's no real protections being placed for Americans, um, you know, especially Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim Americans. And so that raises another concerning question. Um, but so I know there's the U.S. embassy form that we do encourage everybody to fill out just so that the embassy does get... Um, you know, the data in real time, and they see that there are people being denied or discriminated against. Uh, AGP Action has our own hotline um, that we're working on updating as well, that you can either call the hotline or fill out, and we can try to get you the help that you need if you're experiencing something in the moment, or if it's just for us to have the data. I know that ADC also has um, some kind of form, but there's two questions. So the first one is, I mean, if it hasn't been clear up to this point, is it a good idea to admit Israel into the visa waiver program? Is it good for Palestinian Americans or is it not? Look, I mean, I, I believe that if the federal statute was complied with, 
this could be a really important uh, opportunity for uh, the U.S. to uh, to do right by, you know, American citizen travelers who want to freely visit Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Because if the federal statute was complied with, we would be able to all go unmolested uh, and um, and travel to Israel and the occupied territories and, and, and you know, go for, you know, our three month visits and, and leave, not be subjected to mistreatment and, and unreasonable questioning and, and all of that. So, yes, it could have been a good thing if the federal law was strictly complied with, as it has been for the other 40 countries that um, that have entered the program um, when it comes to the reciprocity principle. But in this particular case, I know that there's many people that have had good experiences this trial period, particularly those who've had Palestinian IDs and never got to use the airport before. So that's been a good experience for them. But the trial period is only a few weeks. <laughs> and after the trial period, we don't, uh, I don't expect things to remain as easy as it might have been for the Palestinian West Bank ID holders who are American. And again, what you know, Gaza is not in this, is not in this program. Um, despite what the MOU said, we, we know from, from even consular officials who've responded to emails that they say Gaza is not in the program. And which contradicts what the State Department says, their official spokesperson says Gaza's in, there's just going to be different procedures because of the security situation. But that's not been, you know, that's not been what we we're seeing. So, you know, in a perfect world where laws were obeyed, <laughs> federal laws were obeyed, laws that are meant to protect the security of American citizens, if though if that law was actually going to be um, implemented as written, and um, if we were had mechanisms to ensure that if Israel actually uh, wasn't complying, that it could it would be out, that snapback that Ambassador Tom Nides mentioned, if that those things existed, this could be a good thing for Americans who have been having such difficulties uh, or have been mistreated when traveling to Israeli occupied territories, but that's not the reality that we live in. Yeah, it's been clear. I think aside from the unofficial MOU, just Israel's track record in general and its discriminatory policies, it shows us they have their own mission. It's not going to change overnight, even if they're admitted into a visa waiver program. Um, another question is, which seemingly they will be admitted and the conditions, you know, the laws won't be followed thoroughly. Um, what can we do politically in case Israel is admitted into the program? Well, I mean, that's for organizations like, uh, you know, AJP Action, you know, and um, AMP to, to be thinking about, you know, at the end of the day, the reason why the Biden administration didn't feel like blue needed to be blue in this context uh, or that the American passport was prime over a Palestinian ID card. The reason why they felt like this was something they could do is because they're they're um, not concerned about the political power of uh, Palestinian Americans or Arab Americans or Muslim Americans who might be uh, offended by not being treated equally. So at the end of the day, it is a political issue. It's and the answer is political as well uh, because. This would not have happened if they were concerned about an organized response to uh, this kind of an MOU. Yeah. Um, right now, what we're doing is we're asking constituents, so Americans in general, to sign a petition to the State Department and the Biden administration demanding that they not admit Israel into the visa waiver program. Um, for the simple fact that they have long-standing discriminatory practices um, and also the 30-day trial period is simply not enough. And like you mentioned, Zaha, there's just so many things that have not been taken into consideration. Um, so many loopholes are being given. And if, you know, aside from blue meaning blue or anything, are we going to get to a point as a country where we start to violate our own laws for the sake of an entity that 
honestly doesn't even respect us and has said so multiple times in the last six months that they don't need the United States, um, despite the... You know, we don't even have to go there, Aya, because the question is, does our country here in the United States respect us? Um, you know, U.S. foreign policy towards Israel aside, the issue for me as an American of Palestinian extraction is, is my government protecting me and doing right by me? Am I being treated like every other American in this kind of situation? And the answer is no. And so I think the work that has to be done here and the opportunity that's here is how are we going to ensure that our government hears us on this particular issue? Um, because it's really a domestic issue to me. It's not a foreign policy issue. It's a domestic issue because our government has let us down in terms of um, equal protection under law. And the federal statute exists there. And now if they want to go and, and revise the federal statute to... Um, to allow for this kind of discrimination against classes of Americans, then they, they need to go back to Congress and revise it. There's, you know, there's a, a, a real concern here about the complete disregard for the language of the federal statute, which is pretty clear about reciprocity. So, um, you know, for me, again, it, it's, um, it's an issue for um, Americans to be dealing with our elected officials about more than it's an issue of between Israel and the U.S. You know, the U.S. is doing what it's doing because it's not um, it's not feeling like it needs to listen to its um, citizens on this particular issue. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. And that's why, you know, for our viewers and just Americans in general to understand this issue right now, which is why I think this webinar was necessary. I think just to understand the details and what comes with it, because it might seem glamorous on the surface in an ideal world um, for Palestinians to be able to go back home, you know. Um, but there's some serious issues within our own government. And like you said, our own government respecting us and beyond respecting us is being willing to protect us, which has not been the case. Um, and so I really, you know, we really urge constituents all over the country to sign our petition, to be well aware about this issue. Um, you know, your elected officials work for you at the end of the day. So you should be showing up just as much as um, the other side shows up, which we know happens very often. And it's the reason why our policies are impacted as much as they are. Um, so somebody said ADC just sued um, ELAL Airlines for grossly treating a Palestinian American at the Newark, New Jersey, and Ben Gurion airports in July. Do you have any comments on that? If you're yeah, aware? I mean that actually that treatment. I I saw the case of of this um, young woman. She um, you know she had the misfortune of booking a flight on LL Airlines, which is um, you know, a quasi governmental airline of Israel's. And, um, you know, that airline does not want to have Palestinian passengers or Arab American or Muslim passengers. I know from my own, ex I've I had um, a business trip and someone uh, booked me uh, on El Al and it, I thought it was a Delta flight. And I ended up exactly the same treatment as this woman who, um, you know, she was um, prevented from boarding the, the plane and, and, interrogated, mistreated, I mean, um, and then given like a, given all these reasons why her luggage couldn't be on the plane or um, certain things, items in her bags couldn't travel with her. I had all that happen. And she, so I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what her situation was, but that's a common practice. That's not, that's not a uh, accident. It's that they, uh, that airline does not wish to have um, certain passengers on the, on the plane. Um, and if you um, if you accidentally end up on that uh, airline, um, you can expect um, similar treatment. I mean, like, like I said, this is something I hear over and over again from from friends that I know that have had uh, transfers or some kind of change in their flight where they were rebooked on LL and had similar situations. So, so I think it's it's a very important. Uh, case coming right now as it is uh, with this uh, issue of Israel's admission at the visa waiver program because it really highlights 
the travel difficulties, you know, that Arab Americans, Muslim Americans have, you know, traveling with their identities um, in, in, uh, to Israel. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share on this issue that you think is pressing or any final words to the audience? Yeah, you know, I just um, for, just thank you for having me. I think it like this is important conversation just because we have been given so very little time to um, to understand what's going on. And we have been given so very little information um, about what's going on. So I, I really applaud you, Aya, for organizing this and for AJP uh, and their activism on this. I think information is power. It's going to be very difficult to to change what's already been agreed to, but I think that um, you know there still is an opportunity because, like I said, this uh, MOU is not is not the law; <laughs> it's an understanding that can be changed and revised. And so, it's up to um, constituents uh, in various districts and various states to make their voices heard to their elected officials and to let them know. Um, exactly what this MOU says, because I don't think that um, most members of Congress have any clue what this uh, MOU does and what it says about um, uh, the treatment of different Americans uh, based on their identity. So, so I would um, I would encourage people to reach out and educate their own elected officials about it because it is shocking. Like you, I I was like, oh no way would they. <laughs> would they put this in writing, you know, and, and do this? Like, I actually had much more confidence when I was hearing blue is blue, you know, um, and that the that the U.S. Pastor, passport is prime over all other um, citizenships and nationalities. But, um, you know, I do believe that the officials that were working on this had the best of intentions, but I think it came down to political, uh, a political decision from, from places higher than these folks that were working on it. And so now it's just left to, to um, you know, the people that are affected to, to try to, um, to move their officials. Yeah. Thank you so much, Zaha. This was very informational and I really hope that our audience, you know, takes all these talking points and takes them back to their members of Congress. Um, again, I encourage you to sign our petition. Um, you can find it in the comments. Uh, you can also, somebody asked if it helps to call the White House. It doesn't hurt too. Uh, I would encourage you to take the talking points from the petition um, and utilize those. And if anybody wants to organize meetings with their members of con Congress or call them or email them, um, you can feel free to reach out to us. We have some talking points. A lot of our organizations have um, sent out similar talking points to members of Congress. So they should be aware on the surface if they're reading their emails, but obviously it'll be way more impactful if their own constituents are constantly reaching out to them about this issue, especially within the next two weeks before the trial ends. We need to be putting as much pressure as possible. Um, also, if you plan um, to travel to Palestine during this time, again, um, if you experience discrimination or you're denied entry, please fill out the U.S. Embassy form first and foremost. You can also find that in the chat. Um, it's really important for them to have the data and see that people are being denied during this trial period. Um, you can also fill out our hotline form or contact us on the actual hotline. Um, and we will do our best to try to support you or at least have the data and communication with the State Department and DHS. Um, and if you'd like to do more beyond that, um, please join us for our Advocacy Week in October. Since 2015, American Muslims for Palestine has organized an annual Palestine Advocacy Day and training weekend to educate students, community leaders, and organizers on civic engagement and policy work exclusively on the issue of Palestine. But as of 2021, um, Palestine Advocacy Day was handed off to Americans for Justice in Palestine Action, which is AMP's 501c4 affiliate organization. So join us and register to today to secure your spot at agpaction.org, you can find the registration on there and make sure your elected officials hear your voices and concerns on this issue and everything else. 
our advocacy days are resuming back in person this year. So it's going to be really exciting. Um, and again, thank you so much, Zaha, for being here. Um, really take all the information you learned and take action. With it. Thanks. Thanks.